Hello and welcome to SMTV Live on this Tuesday afternoon. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Duncan Gilman. And I'm Jonathan Sellers. We're coming to you live without a studio audience. Just like our heroes, Jimmy Fallon and, David, and Letterman. David Letterman did last night. Because of the effects of Sandy, they had to turn away, send home their studio audiences. Yes, yes, and uh, it's been incredible, some of the pictures coming through, Duncan, uh, to see sort of the damage that Storm has brought on. I mean, it's really incredible. Especially on Instagram. People are using Instagram to post 10 photos a second. Um, wow. At, at least during the height of the storm. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's amazing the way people are using social media to come... Um, to come through and, and, and publish what's going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, it's an amazing thing. I think sometimes we take for granted our ability to be able to, you know, take these photos and capture these moments and then share them amongst each other. But some of the images, like you said, Instagram has been a great way for reporters, for news services and outlets to t survey the damage without necessarily have to sending their crews out you know, and all over the city. I mean, we're getting pictures from all locations amongst, you know, New Jersey, uh, Washington, D.C., New York. So Instagram has played a, a pivotal part in news organizations gaining, you know, valuable information on the status of certain street corners and, and buildings in the areas. It's been pretty incredible. And the other social media platforms, it's, the news spreads faster than it would otherwise right. than on broadcast news. You get tweets about you know, donating blood for the Red Cross this week faster than they could ever get the message out through a press release or anything else that you might see. Sure, or donating money. To or donating money, victims. exactly. It's yeah. been really incredible. Social media has some great tools that help and unfortunately help during these unfortunate crises. Some people, I think, possibly partly in <laughs> because they want to get in the social media game sooner rather than later and want to start posting pictures, they're posting fake pictures. Oh, no. So they're coming up with these, these um, Photoshopped images like this one. This is not from New York One. Right. This image is from The Day After Tomorrow, oh. the movie. I see, I see. Uh, so uh, Matchable had this great article about some of the images that are actually not real, that are that are, people are claiming are from Hurricane Sandy. So it's kind of interesting to uh, to take a look. Sure, and uh, you know, I I don't know why they necessarily need to use the fake photos. I mean, they look in incredible, but there have been some incredible shots that were real. You know, I think these fake photos. Absolutely, sort of the real ones are dramatic enough. Mm -hmm. Why you don't even need these these photoshopped versions, right? Yeah, so. but interesting to see how fast these kinds of things will spread, and how how many of my friends on Facebook were posting these these images. Yeah. Um, and it's you know, on the one hand, it's good to get the word out, but on the other hand, it's it, we need a little bit of journalistic integrity. Uh, integrity here. I think. What do you, what ways do you uh, think that social media sites should work on to help? you know, improve the people from not being able to post these fake photos and assume they're real. I mean, like you said, there needs to be some sort of integrity there. You know, people are assuming that these photos are fake until, a, you know, a news source reveals they're real. I mean, this could be a problem right in the future. What I think for this particular case, like mm -hmm. a fake photo or a, or a manipulated photo, I think it's up to the individual. I don't think it's up to brands or um, maybe even the news sources. I think it's up to you to go research um, whether this is true. Same thing I would recommend if you saw a scam come through or something that looked a little fishy. You know, there are great sites out there like Snopes.com mm -hmm. where you can verify whether these things are true or not. So I think most of the burden should be on us, the individual person, to make sure that what we're reading is the truth. Or po reposting. Or reposting, exactly, even more importantly, is, is actually true. Mm. As always, whenever you have a question or a topic you'd like us to discuss on the broadcast, please send it over to us. We're always interested in what you're working on, and we would love to be involved. You can email us your questions to questions at splashmediau.com, or you can tweet them to us by using the hashtag SMTVQuestions. Let's start out today with our first question from Hillary. Hillary wants to know, how do we identify influencers? Well, there, Hillary, there are a lot of ways you can identify influencers, but I think a, a great way to start is to look at, you know, the content that you consume, uh, whether it be video or blog related. Uh, take a look at that content and see what the content creators are doing amongst social media or what the people in your industry um, who, you know, read these certain content sites, whether it be, you know, like a professional news site with, with you know, legitimate journalistic writers or just bloggers that are, have great passions for the subject matter and constantly putting out good content. I would take a look and start there and, you know, kind of work your way from there to see where they get their information, who they're reposting, who they're retweeting. Um, I would, I would, 
start there and then and use those as your first way to identify influencers and then kind of work your way down from from that and and then try to decide you know who is the most who are the most relevant influencers for your industry or your brand and and Duncan you and I were having a discussion that I think would be valuable for our our audience do you consider an, a person who's an influencer as somebody who just has a lot of fans or followers I mean does that constitute a great influencer for you know, an industry or brand? That's a great question, and I think not on its own. I think you can have thousands of followers, but if you don't do anything with them, if you don't post something that encourages them to take some particular action, if you don't have influence over them, you, you're not um, influencing them in some way, then you're not necessarily an influencer. You just happen to have thousands of fans. Um, if you do have thousands of fans or followers, take advantage of it. I mean, I would use that to your advantage, whether you are, um, a business leader or a business owner and encourage them to take some sort of action. I kind of like, I think we should get t-shirts made. You can't influence if you're not influencing. Duncan <laughs> Gilman. I like that. I like it. That's my circle <laughs> logic for you today. <laughs> well, and part of, the, part of the, what you need to know is, is what an influencer is, like what, what kind of position this person would be. Because I think in Hillary's case, and a lot of people, you already know who the influencers are. Right. You know their names. You just don't associate it with the word influencer, which is something we say all the time. That's it, true. It's a person who, it, just like you said, maybe a senior editor at an industry magazine or publication. It could be someone in charge of a governing body for your industry. Someone who's not necessarily a competitor, not in a, in a competitive business, but, uh, but someone who is actively involved in the industry, putting out blogs and video and, and uh, you know, people like Hillary probably already know their names. Mm. It's just a matter of identifying them so you could talk to them. Right, and f sort of focusing on them and re reading as much as you can from right. what they publish. Mm -hmm. Harper wrote to us, what do you do when someone you do not know endorses you on LinkedIn? I think the bigger question, Harper, and I could be wrong, I think the bigger question is, should I link to people, should I connect with people I don't know on LinkedIn? Because the endorsements you're going to see come through and the people you're going to be endorsing are going to be your connections, but you might not necessarily know every single one of your connections. Um, and that's okay. It's okay not to know or have met personally, face-to-face, -face, every single one of your connections, as long as there's some method behind it, as long as you can get something out of that connection, if there's some networking advantage to you, great, take the endorsement, endorse them back if you want to. That's where it gets tricky, because if you don't know the person, you don't necessarily know that they're good at gardening. But right. Also, it, you, it's a risk you take. Sure, and you don't want you know, someone's endorsement to hurt you. I mean, there are some people you don't well, want endorsements true. from. Yeah. So you have to be very careful with who you accept on LinkedIn and then also who's, you know, because if the, if someone were to endorse you, like, frankly, if Duncan endorses me, I'm in trouble. Nobody's going to want, <laughs> nobody's going to want me nobody's for anything. Nobody's going to want my endorsement. Yeah, of course not, you know, you're a troublemaker. <laughs> so, no, I'm just teasing. But, uh, you know, so you have to be very careful and walk that fine line and, and be sure to manage your LinkedIn profile as well as you would your Facebook or Twitter profiles and who you're following and who's following you or you know, who are you connecting with, so. Right, and just because you, you send out your URL, your, your profile URL for people to connect with you, doesn't mean you have to accept every That's single right. person who does. That's right. I mean, I, I've tweeted out my own personal profile and invited people to connect, and if someone doesn't match my requirements, if someone doesn't quite fit the, the network I'm trying to build, I can say no. Mm -hmm. That's true. I always say no. Brianna, <laughs> we have suddenly Nancy Reagan here. <laughs> Brianna wants to know, what are some good Thanksgiving holiday campaign ideas for Facebook? Well, there's uh, all sorts of things you can do on Facebook for uh, for Thanksgiving. One thing that just popped in my head is a Gobble for Goods campaign. Where Gobble for Goods, I love I, it. I love an idea, like especially if you have a lo multiple locations where you do a canned food drive, and then maybe incorporate it. You have people upload videos of themselves gobbling. And then they get to choose the charity. Whoever's the best gobbler gets to choose the charity of where those canned goods go. <laughs> I really like brilliant. That idea. I just came up with that. It's brilliant. Two minutes ago, <laughs> gobble for goods. And you know, a couple other ideas like a, you could do a a thankful Thursday. Sure. So every Thursday, post something you're you're thankful for, or have people submit a photo of something that they're thankful for. And I did a quick search while we were talking here um, of some Thanksgiving apps on Facebook. You can download any one of these. Use them on your page. Mm -hmm. 
um, their, their Thanksgiving greetings, Thanksgiving quotes. Uh, you can create your own, have some Thanksgiving recipes, have people submit a recipe that is their favorite Thanksgiving food. Fa recipes, you can have them um, upload pictures of their favorite dishes they've cooked or the most elegant dishes and run a contest through that if you, you know, choose to do so. You could have them write about their favorite Thanksgiving stories or what Thanksgiving means to them, some of their top family memories from that. I mean, there's all sorts of different things you could do with Thanksgiving and incorporating it into your marketing strategy and campaign. Yeah, as with all promotions and campaigns, Brianna, what you want to do is make sure you know the end result, what you want the end result to be. Sure. Are you trying to get names on your email list? Then make sure you have a simple, easy to use form. Are you trying to get likes? Make sure you're clear that the next step is to like. So maybe you have a fan um, gating opportunity on your app so that people have to click to see the next portion of, of whatever your campaign is. Right. Thanksgiving is, is one of those times. I mean, we have a, a long stretch of holidays here yeah. with ample opportunity to, yep. you know, promote your page. So, you know, do what you can, be creative, and have some fun with it. People love to have fun. Absolutely. Justin wrote to us, what is feed, P-H-E-E-D? Feed, feed with a P-H. It's, a, uh, it's actually a new, relatively new social network, and it's been embraced readily by celebrities. A lot of celebrities are, are on feed now. It's You're on feed, right, Duncan? <laughs> I actually haven't joined feed oh, okay. yet. Um, I'm, I'm testing the waters here, but it's, uh, it's a really interesting looking, out, let me show you what channel here. It's interesting looking setup here. This is Paris Hilton's feed. Oh. And what makes it unique, I mean, for, for most of the functionality, it's like... I thought you said like, celebrities. <laughs> I'm just kidding. You were on fire today. I am on fire today. <laughs> I love it. Um, for most of the functionality, it's a lot like Twitter. Uh -huh. um, it's about real-time updates. Um, th the format, the structure looks a little bit like Google+, Plus too, because it incorporates the, the Twitter real-time updates, but sort of more of a Facebook or Google+, mm -hmm. layout to it, I think. Mm -hmm with the, the images taking um, priority in, in the middle of the feeds. Uh, the, the, one, the, the one or two unique things that I, I think can help feeds stand apart are the, the broadcasting capability mm -hmm. and also the video capabilities here. And they're, they're kind of linked to, you can do live broadcasts from your feed. Oh, wow. And I think that's something that is going to help it stand out as a social platform. And also, uh, celebrities can charge for some of these services, That right? is another big distinguishing factor, yeah. So, you know, that's a new opportunity for them to sort of monetize their content. And uh, also, you know, one thing with all those photos, it kind of reminds me of the new MySpace layout that we previewed a few weeks ago that's as well. That's true, you yeah, know, with it the does. The incorporation of the photos. So it's interesting to sort of see how um, social media networks are, are you know, kind of improving for the next stage of their, you know, sort of life and, and how they're incorporating photos more and how this, everything looks a little bit more customizable. Kind of, you know, it's kind of like they're reversing back because, you know, when Facebook came out, there was a plain, you know, format. Everybody had it. I mean, it still is that way. Everybody right. has the same format where they post their photo one here, their cover photo here. And now it seems like social media networks are going back to more of a customization model, whereas everything is it seems incorporates that way, photos. Yeah. And so do you think that's going to take on, take off? I don't know. It's, it's hard to say. And, I, you know, we could probably have a whole other show and debate about the death of MySpace and why it happened. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm not sure that it's necessarily because of this shift in customization. I think um, people love, uh, imagery is always going to be big. People want to see videos. People want to see photos. People love these live streams. That's why I think the broadcasting is going to be big. And I think this subscription model is intriguing. I think mm. it's so interesting that you can now charge people to subscribe to you. If you're providing something that's really valuable that you would go out and seek on your own, you might pay for it. Right. It might be something that you'd pay for if it's something, you know, we're seeing this with a lot of comedians too. Mm. We're seeing this with people who are uh, doing their shows and then charging $5 to watch the stream version of it right. online. Uh, there's so Across the board, so many different industries are taking advantage of this. I will give you the content. Don't go over here for the content. I will give it to you, yeah. and I'll charge you this much. Forcing out the middleman. Forcing out the middleman. I think that's part of the reason we're seeing the big changes in the publishing industry and the, and the music industry, too. Mm -hmm. That's going to do it for today. I want to thank you for joining us this Tuesday afternoon. Keep those questions and topic ideas coming in. For Splash Media, I'm Duncan Gilman. And I'm Jonathan Sellers. Have a great day.